Hey Macquarie, welcome to Church Online. It is so good to see you here today. I'm Brody, and I am your MC this week. Um, if you've been on the last couple of weeks, you might have seen me in the chat wearing a banana suit. So I wore my mustard today so that you would still recognize me. Um, have you had a good week this week? I have actually had a really good week after six months of working from home and working on my own. I was back in an office today, or this week, sorry, with people. And I just love that. I love being back working with a team and being with friends. And speaking of things I love, I also found out this week that I've got a hobby. Um, I've never been a hobby person before. I've never really had one, but I've got a hobby now. Um, if you can think what you think it might be, you can put it in the chat, but you won't guess it because <laughs> it's a bit odd. I found out that I love to gurney. Yes, that's right. I found out that I love cleaning concrete, pebble creek, pavers. I don't care what type, I don't discriminate. I like cleaning all of them. So if you've got some pressure cleaning at home that you need done, you now know who to call. Hey church, we are a few weeks into the year now, which statistically means that the majority of you have now failed all of your New Year's resolutions. Now, don't feel bad about it. I found out a few years ago that I never make it to January with any of my New Year's resolutions intact. So you know what I did to make it better? I just stopped making them. <laughs> so I don't have New Year's resolutions anymore. But it does remind me of a proverb, one of my favorite actually, Proverbs 16, 9, and the Amplified says this. It says, a man's mind plans his ways as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. And I think at the start of the year, we like to get a bit of a blueprint, a bit of an overview and a map for our year, but we leave the details off. But God is in the details and he actually knows the obstacles that are going to come up, the detours, the things that we don't know about. So I just want to encourage you um, today that if you are starting to feel like your year is not panning out the way you planned already, that let's just remember that God is in the details. God is in your May 22, he's in your September 23. He's gone ahead before us. So I just want to pray that over you today. So Lord, I just thank you that you tell us that your sheep hear your voice and that you lead us, God. And I just thank you that um, as we start getting into the, the nitty gritty of this year, as it starts to look different to how we plan, Lord, I just thank you that you're in our steps, God, that you are a God that leads us behind or beside still waters. So God, I just pray for everyone in this service this morning that's listening, Lord, I just pray that you will help us to um, give our plans over to you that we will be able to see you in those moments that don't seem like our plans. And I thank you that you are a God that establishes our steps, that you guide us and that you make our paths straight, Lord. Amen. Hey, guys, we have got a great Sunday for you today. We've got Mark there bringing the word and I have seen his notes and it is a timely word for the season that we're in. But before we hear from Mark, let's um, spend some time in worship together. So I just want to encourage you, you know, I've been working from home. I know there's distractions. So find a comfy space and let's just make a decision that for the next 20 to 30 minutes, we're just going to fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to tune out those distractions and we're just going to lean into what he wants to speak to us about today. We're going to go into worship. We have a new song and the first words are the gospel of Jesus is the hope of the ages. And it's the foremost thing that unites this diverse crowd that you are part of this morning. So I want you to tune your ears in as we worship. The gospel of Jesus is the hope of the ages, but in brighter and brighter and standing forever. The church he is building, nothing can stop it. It's a city that's shining, a light in the darkness. Nothing can stop it. Oh, Christ was. Yeah. 
with us. Feel for you stuck at home a little bit, but so glad you can um, still be join us and be part of of what's happening. Um, Inwood and Dan's there, and people like Jay are putting together a well-being project, mental health course. So I think it's a really good thing because I this relates to what I'm preaching on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I you know had just finished my study for the day, so I'm usually in a pretty good frame, but I was having my afternoon nap. And this negative thought came to me, and my mind completely unraveled. And it had never, ever happened to me before in my whole life. And I'm thinking, that's weird. How could I unravel so easily? So that made me feel like, I don't want to unravel. So I went and had about an hour in prayer and just kind of relayed my foundation in God to make sure it was solid. But then the scary bit was I had to come back with the foundation to the other side of the thought that unraveled me and come back through it with the foundation to see if it worked. And that was a bit scary, but it worked. (laughs) So it was good. And we're about to see that happen with Elijah, where uh, right after his greatest victory, like it was a stunning victory where he defeated the prophets of Baal, but then someone threatens his life, and he does the bolt, and he really unravels. And it's, it's just very interesting. And two things happen, and I'll, I'll read the story to you in a minute. But two things happen. God asks him the same question twice. And the first time, it's like, come and meet me. You've got to have my presence because you're unraveled. You need my presence. But then this funny thing happens the second time just after that. He says, come and meet me again. And then he gives him direction. He says, go back from where you came. And it's almost like what I had to do, he has to go back to the other side of the hassles or the threat and walk back through it with God in a way where he's looking after himself properly and take it on again. It's just a really interesting thing of we need the presence, but we also need, I don't know whether to call it direction or purpose, but um, I was listening to Brian Houston preach this morning and he talked about how important purpose is. You know, whether you're kind of half retired like me or you've lost your job in COVID or, or whatever it is, he, he, he was preaching out of Ecclesiastes 3 1. There is a time for everything and, a, uh, and every season for every purpose under heaven. And I was just thinking it through a bit. So I don't go so well with figuring COVID out. I figured I just don't know. <laughs> so I'm reading Revelation in, in my study at the moment and I'm thinking, gee, this feels like end times. But I, if I was in the Second World War, I would have thought that was end times. And I was in the Great Depression, I would have thought that was end times. But it could be. And if it is end times, it means things aren't going to go back to normal. They're just going to unravel a bit more. But I'm not prophesying that because I, I just don't know. But nevertheless, I feel I need this flexibility in my spirit and my soul in this season because it just does weird things, doesn't it? And, and we've all lost control. So the control freak in all of us is going, <laughs> um, and we just don't know. Um, so let's just have a, have a look at it in Scripture. So, you know, Elijah's one of the most powerful men in the Old Testament. He announces a great drought and it comes. He's fed by ravens when there's no food around. With the widow at Zarephath, he, uh, you know, gives her oil and it never runs out. And he raises the sun from the dead. And, he's, you know, he does amazing stuff. And then he has this big confrontation with all the prophets of Baal. I won't go into it, but... At the end of that, Jezebel makes this empty threat. Someone said, made by a bitter idolater who lost face in the sacrifice showdown. So um, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, it'll come up, but I'm just going to jump through it. Um, Ahab the king told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. And she ends up saying, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life, Elijah, like like." that of one of them. So I'm thinking, okay, Elijah's going to take her out as well. But he runs. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Um, When he finally meets with God, he's suicidal. He goes, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. So he's obviously not looking after himself. Um, you know, and food was provided. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, 
for the journey is too much for you. Like, you haven't looked after yourself. I've had a, a bit of burnout many decades ago. I, I know that. You know, the, the journey's too much. You're going to kill me. Ian even referred to it last Sunday in the 8th when God said, okay, I said, God, the vision you've given me is killing me and it's going to take me out. Can you give me a smaller vision? And he said, okay, plant five churches. I'm thinking, what the, that's not a small vision. But I did it and within the direction that he gave me, for some reason was the health and safety that I needed. It just doesn't make sense, can't explain it. Um, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, he ate, and he drank, and he was strengthened. He travels 40 days then and 40 nights. In verse 9, then he went into a cave and spent the night. But again, it's like he collapses under the tree. Again, he's like in the cave. I don't even know if he's got intentions to come out. It could be that suicide presents itself again. He thought, well, God didn't take me out. I'm going to take myself out. It's just too much. So in the cave, he's not in a good place. Um, then the word of the Lord comes to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So I, th- I think that indicates in that cave, not, not so much what are you doing, but like, who are you? Where are you at? And you're hiding in the cave. This is not healthy. This is not good. This, is, this could take you out. Um, so what are you doing here, Elijah? I think God doesn't do it out of anger. It's a compassionate plea. Um, and he talks to God and he does this thing, you know, They've killed your prophets and now they're trying to kill me too. He says that a number of times in it. In verse 11, the Lord said, Go out, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by you. So God provides the presence. This is really key. And so there's a great and powerful wind, but God's not in the wind. There's a violent earthquake and God's not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there's a fire, but he's not in the fire. But after the fire, there's a gentle whisper that Elijah hears. And, it, and it's so interesting. It's like he's just done the most spectacular things in history in the showdown with the prophets of Baal. And it's like God goes, forget about the spectacular. Forget about the obvious. Forget about the powerful. Let's just go to the quiet place, which is what I had to do when I unraveled. I had to get to the quiet place. Um, Uh, Elijah heard the voice. The voice said to him, what are you doing here? That's the second time of the question. He replies, same thing, they're trying to kill me too. He's got the same complaint. He's afraid. The Lord says to him, go back the way you came. That's so interesting. Go back the way you came. And at the end it says, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Um, I thought, I don't know why. I just wanted to read that out because it's a bit like, listen, COVID's not your God. Your life's not based on it. Yeah, it's having an effect and it's forcing some things, but it's not your God. You, you get into the presence and go the direction God's saying, whether it's go forward or whether it's go back or whatever it is, um, he's your God. So let's just look at a few things. Um, I, I don't feel embarrassed about falling over some reason. I thought I would, but it's just... Sometimes my knee doesn't bend far enough. That's what life's like. You should see my dog's going a bit lame at the moment and we both try and get out of this really low lounge we've got at home. We really have trouble, the both of us. It's like, that's just life. It's okay, isn't it? Um, Novak Djokovic, eh? There's things I really like about him and then he does really dumb things and so I don't know whether to like him or not like him, but I thought what I feel for him in is this. He's on the verge of, you know, not really to me being the greatest player in history, but in terms of winning the most Grand Slams. He just needs one more to overtake Nadal and Federer. But he's, he's caught himself out. And they're all now banning the non-vax players, so it looks like he won't be able to play in any more Grand Slams. So he can't do it. So he's confronted with his own pride now. What will his pride let him do? Does he have to stick to his guns, but that will cost him what he's aimed his whole life for? Or will he humble himself? He doesn't really have to admit he's wrong. I think he just needs to humble himself and he can probably pull it off. But I think it's really interesting for all of us because it's a type of all of us. There's this really great side of us and there's a side that struggles and there's just some pride things that catches out. I'll tell you, one of the tricks with pride is when there's a root thing in our life of it and we've been wrong about something for a long time but we've been sticking to our guns the trick is this 
the longer you let it go on, the more humility it takes to admit you were wrong, to get over it so you can move on in a healthy way. It's, pride is very, very tricky like that. And we have one um, older member on our board who's just such a valuable member of our board. His dad was a pastor, but he was backslidden for 30 years. And he, got, he came back to God in our church. But he can say to me, I was backslidden for 30 years and it cost me. I want to tell you, not many people can do it. It takes, it takes a real lot of humility to go, I was, I was, I was wrong. So just, just, you know, when you're fighting your battle with your pride that's stopping you getting what you want, just, just remember that. It's better to go the humility road. Um, okay, let me just change tack a bit. Depression often comes from when we feel unable to construct a healthy future for ourselves. And, and in a way, healthy future is a bit threatened at the moment. But watch this. God redeems suffering. That's why your greatest ministry eventually flows from your greatest pain. That's why, you know, Bad Friday is actually called Good Friday when Jesus died. So much pain there. How anyone came up with Good Friday, it's a wonder they didn't get their head punched in when they come up with that name. But, you know, with, with hindsight, we think, yeah, look, look what it's achieved. Um, a photo will come up. This giant pumpkin appeared in my garden when I got back from um, holidays. It had been there the whole time and I'd never seen it, but because I was away and not watering the garden, well, you know how pumpkin leaves are big? They all sort of died back and I came home to, to feed my chooks and then to go back on holidays again. And there's just this giant pumpkin. I could barely pick it up, just sitting there. And my neighbour's on his back fence and I'm thinking... Brian's bought this and put it there to trick me. I'm going, oh, good one, Brian. He goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, this giant pumpkin appeared. But what enabled it to appear? It's kind of a dumb analogy, but I thought it was the heat and the withering of the leaves that when they died back, something good was there. And I think that's what God's doing with our trials. He's building something in us that's significant and good but it's never going to be revealed until that, that dry season comes where you come under threat of it and the leaves die back, but then that good thing gets to come out. It's like um, it happens a lot in the Bible, and I think that's where God trusts you more than what you think he does. He'll let you go through something. You don't know if you're going to come through it, and it threatens you, but on the other, on the other side, there's this beautiful new quality in you, beautiful new fruit. Um, okay, so... Two points. Number one, ask God to reveal to you where you're really at and meet him there. So that was what I had to do when I unraveled. Um, what, are you, what are you doing here? It's like, Mark, what are you doing here? You're not in a good way all of a sudden. How did that happen? Um, let me just give you an answer out of Romans 5. I just love this because I still come across denominations sometimes when I preach away that kind of aren't into the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I just want to read to you out of Romans. They think, you know, the apostolic anointing was just for the apostles and the Holy Spirit thing was just for then and, and not for now and we've just got to behave before God and then he'll bless us kind of theology. But Romans 8, now I'm just going to read from verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God and it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Now watch this. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God or can never please God. You can't please God just by being good. You don't earn grace. That's why it's called grace. It's a bit like what Jordan was saying in, in his offering word. Um, we, we give because we're being blessed. We're not giving to get blessed. Um, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If Now watch this. This is critical to this wrong theology. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So the Bible's talking about the Holy Spirit living in you, so I'm okay with it. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Whoa. So just be careful of your Holy Spirit theology. There's the Bible. Talk about him living in you. And if he's not living in you, you don't belong to him. Whoa, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, 
That's clear enough. Verse 14 says, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I love that. And by him we cry out, Abba, Father. So, you know, Romans 8 covers it big time. Just make sure you got him in you and you're listening to him. And when you have an Elijah moment, get in there. So, so if I don't feel like praying when I feel like that, I just start reading the word. And the word kind of takes me and softens me and gets me somewhere. It's almost like... I have conversation with God with the word in front of me. So I read it and I talk to him as things come to me. Um, Chris Hodges wrote a book on um, coming out of the cave because he had bad burnout. He's got about 60,000 in his church in Birmingham, Alabama, Church of the Highlands. Um, he says, my burnout from, was from my own lifestyle choices of being too needed. Wow. He says, my first recovery test was being able to have a proper Sabbath rest. He then, he then quotes Viktor Frankl, you know, the, the Jewish guy who, who went through the Holocaust and survived and he you know, had a lot of survival guilt. But one of the world's great psychologists, him working that out in his book is an incredible insight. But he says this amazing statement, Viktor Frankl. And I don't know if it fits, but it's a heck of a good life principle. This is when you face a tragic event. Between the tragic event and our response to the tragic event is a small space. He says this, your power and your freedom are decided in the choices you make in that space. There's this moment. And and, and I know with each loved one I've lost in my family, there is. There's like this moment of, am I going to collapse and get angry with God and fall into the flesh? Or I'm going to walk in and say... Just be with me, God. I I really need you and walk through it with him. Um, Your question may be different, but there's this space, and it's a really important space how to to handle that. Because, you know, the wrong response in that space can take years to get over, but the right one can, you know, while it still hurts, it can save you a lot of heartache and and wrong direction. Um, I'll just finish this from Chris Hodges' book. It talks about the road to depression and the road out of depression. On the road to depression, uh, there's grief. There's learned helplessness that you have to unlearn. There's social disappointment and loss of purpose. Those things are on that road and can take you to it. The road out of depression has meaningful work, authentic relationships, the hope of a better future. It has self-esteem based on values that reward and protect you. And he said, also, you're able to enjoy life's most natural pleasures. And he talks about being in creation. Okay. Second point of the sermon. This is like, go back the way you came. It's kind of, um, I thought, wow, that's so interesting. So relay the foundation. You walk back through life with a different mindset. I I've, I've, haven't got all the answers on it, but I just want to quote about four people. First one was Steve Beasley when he did the painting. I think it'll come up, it'll come up on the screen, Steve's painting from last week um, with the shadow. Because we live in God's light, there is always a shadow, he said. I was talking to him after the service and he, he read this out to me. Because we live in God's light, there is always a shadow following us. What we're supposed to do is keep the shadow behind us and you walk towards the light. And I think that's the right answer because there is a scripture somewhere that says there's no shadows in heaven, which is really interesting. So, you know, our danger is, is to be looking at the dark part, um, especially if, if you have a negative bent. Nicky Gumbel, who's one of England's greatest, you know, minister, Christian ministers, just an incredible guy. Uh, he developed the Alpha Course um, and has an amazing church. We, we had a Zoom with him and some of the state exec. It was just amazing. Um, And he said an amazing thing. He goes, there's a lot of people these days like Zacchaeus. Now, Now listen to this. This is an amazing conclusion. They want to see Jesus, but they don't want to be seen by Jesus. So that story ends well in Scripture because Jesus spots him and does the grace thing and it's a great outcome. But, you know, pre Jesus saying something to him, he's hiding in the tree. He doesn't want to be seen, but he wants to see. Now, I'll just say to the online people, this is one application I've got. Online's really important because if you can't get here, 
it keeps you spiritually alive. It's critical and crucial. And I think online reach goes much further than what we can draw into the church. However, just be careful that if you just stay online forever, even when you come, come back to church, if it becomes your preference, the danger is you're like Zacchaeus. You're just wanting to look and see Jesus but not be seen. Because the trick is when we come to church and we're seen and we're with people, it takes a bit of tolerance. You've got to wear a mask. It takes a bit of risk. You could, you could catch a disease. And it takes a bit of tolerance because not everyone's nice how you like them to be nice. The tolerance is good because in the midst of all that mix, you're meeting amazing people and having incredible conversations and iron is sharpening iron like God wants it to. So I'm all for online, but just, you know, don't get in a rut with it. Um, Darlene Check, uh, I've got to hear her share a few times and also speak to her a fair bit about her cancer journey. Um, she said, it's, it's really interesting because all of a sudden you've got cancer and you have to travel in this direction you don't want to go in. And it reminded me of Elijah when, when God said, go, go back. And you'd think, that means I'm going to have conflict if I go back because we all like to avoid conflict. I said, so what did you do? You, know, you weren't obviously going to enjoy the direction. She said, Mark, I just had to dig new wells with God that would sustain me and get me through. And if you think about digging a well, especially, you know, in Israel territory, it's pretty hard. It's hard ground. So it takes a while to dig the well, to have the water. And it's like that scripture about the swallow building a nest near God's altar. It's like that. You just have to keep running to the space and build the space until it can sustain you. And you just keep going back there daily to take a drink. And eventually, eventually you come through. But I... I just thought it was an amazing statement. You just have to learn to dig new wells. Um, so when we have to talk through conflict with people, four principles. First one is honesty, not avoidance. Second one is empathy. It's spending some time trying to understand their point of view. And I was listening to a really good psychologist the other day. So <laughs> I got caught out because I'm thinking, I get this, I get this. And I'm used to making one empathy statement with someone and then moving on. And she said, don't do one empathy statement. Do at least three. Like, inquire of them. And why do you feel like that? And I like that quality about you. Like, have some conversation on their side of the argument. At least three things, she said. So I felt quite convicted by that. Uh, third thing was autonomy. They have to be left with their own freedom to choose. Don't control them, release them. And the last one was quite significant. She said, um, you've got to use reflection, and that is seeing their core values and reflecting back to them their values. And when we can pull that off, she said, rapport is, re is restored. And even though you don't agree, you don't have to agree, even though you don't agree, you can go off and still have rapport with each other because they feel understood and respected. I thought, man, that's, that's really, really good, good insight. I'll finish with this. Um, when I unravel, I noticed this. I did kind of a gentle journey back to health, but I thought, I really just wanted someone to yell at me and tell me the right thing to do. You idiot, get up, you know, do this. And I was reading about John the Baptist the other day because I just read this quote by Jim Carrey, and I'll come back to John the Baptist. He said, this is, you know, actor-comedian. I wish everyone was rich and famous so they could see that it's not the answer and it's a really dumb thing to aim for. <laughs> I, like, I like that. But then I'm reading John the Baptist and it says this and I thought, gee, this is a word for us today. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I looked up the original word. It's kind of got this yelling component. So John the Baptist is yelling something to us. Here's what he's yelling. It says, he's a messenger sent and he yells, Prepare your heart for the coming of your Messiah. Clear a straight path inside your heart for him. That was, that was what I do. Even though I've been a senior pastor for 30 years, guess what? I still have to shut up, bow the knee, humble myself and go, I've got to clear the path again. It's overgrown. Stuff's gotten in the way. And, and do that. And I thought, there is someone yelling at us, John the Baptist. <laughs> so sometimes we just got to, clear the way again. Thanks, Jordan. Tell me. 
Church this year is ramping up and so is church life and we have got so many events coming up. There's one that I really want to highlight to you because it's happening tonight. So there's no six, uh, no 5 p.m. service at church, but we do have our church family carnival happening at 6 p.m. tonight at Chelsea Pool. Now, you need to get yourself there because it is free entry. There's going to be a free barbecue. There's going to be a donut game. There's going to be swimming races, novelty races. But best of all, there are going to be people there from every single service. So if you're like me and there's a service you don't go to, there's probably people who are part of your church family that you don't get to see very often. And I cannot wait to bump into them and to catch up with them tonight because they're going to be there. So whatever you've got planned for the rest of the day, make sure that you spend some time getting your cozies out, your budgie smugglers, your speedos, whatever you want to call them, any towel, any sunscreen, and we'll see you at um, Charlestown Pool at six o'clock tonight. Also, we've got the wellbeing project coming up, so we're just going to watch a quick video to find out a little bit more about that. The power of our mind is unbelievable. Our mind constantly feeds into the state of our mental health, driving our motivation and sense of well-being. We are running a project on well-being designed to help you look deeper into managing your own well-being that will give you practical advice to apply to your everyday life. Our world is becoming increasingly more intense and fast-paced, but it's really encouraging to see that people are starting to reflect on what's important in their life and prioritise those areas. And it's even more encouraging to see that one of those areas is their social and emotional wellbeing. Project Wellbeing is about being honest with yourself. In the construction industry, we know all about that because it's one of the worst for mental health and suicide all across Australia. It will launch this coming February and culminate in our final walk to wellbeing, a 20 kilometre walk as the final stepping stone of the project. The cost for the whole project is $30 and will be run over five sessions. Head to our website to register or to find out more details. All right, church. So next week, we are going to be back at church for three services. So we have Bruce Robbo from Hope You See coming. He has been a friend of Macquarie for so long, and he's got a prophetic gift. And so I just think if you really want to hear what God has got to say for 2022, you've got to get to church next week to hear from Bruce. Um, but I just want to thank you for joining us online this week. I hope you've had a great week. Um, at church online and I hope that you have a great week and we'll see you tonight at the pool or next week at church. See you later.